Uh, next up, we have a, a man who really needs no introduction. Um, he's known as the chairman of the board here at UCLA. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Dan Levy. Hold on, Dan, not yet. I'm going to say a few things about you before you come up. So uh, Dan grew up in uh, the state of New Jersey, um, and then thereafter uh, moved out to California, where he did his undergrad at Stanford University. And um, you'll hardly ever have a conversation with Dan where there isn't a story about his days at Stanford uh, that comes out, and they're awesome stories. Uh, thereafter, uh, medical school at uh, uh, Stanford as well, UCSF, UCSF. Residency, uh, UCSF, and then his fellowship uh, at UCLA. Uh, Dan has been a personal mentor of mine in the cath lab, uh, in the interventional space, and uh, I really don't think I would be doing what I'm doing today uh, without his uh, guidance and his mentorship. He's going to talk to us about catheter-based interventions in the failing Fontan patient. Come on up. Thanks so much, Jamil. Uh, thanks so much to Jamil and Kevin, and especially to Jeanette and all the conference organizers. Jeanette did an unbelievable job and really poured her time and energy into this. So Jamil did a really nice thing, allowing me to talk about the sexy stuff in CATH. So I'm going to skip a lot of the basic stuff that Jamil already talked about and really try to give an overview of what we can offer Fontan patients now in the CATH lab and what we may be able to offer them in the future. This slide is one of the few publications from you know, another decade, really, from the you know, dinosaur era of Fontaine interventions. And even in the 90s, um, before we had all this cool stuff to do, 60% of the Fontaine patients were having some sort of intervention, intervention by 10 years. Uh, that number is a lot higher now, and especially uh, when you start talking about failing Fontans who always get catheterized. Jamil went over this already. We're very careful to zero our transducers. We're very sensitive toward any obstruction. And when you are a failed Fontan, the number one thing that we need to prove, whether it's in the cath lab or whether it's with cross-sectional imaging, is that you do not have obstruction. You see this is a Fontan angiogram. We're really careful to image all parts of the Fontan, including the abdominal venous return. And it's, you'll really rarely see Fontans without stents. And if you look carefully, this patient has a stent that's obscured by the TEE probe. I'm not going to go into stenting. Stenting a Fontan is very easy. The important thing about uh, uh, stenting Fontans is you need to understand that even a one millimeter of mercury gradient is potentially significant. We oftentimes stent obstructions in Fontans that don't have pressure gradients under anesthesia. And it's really important to look in three dimensions, as Jamil uh, mentioned, not only before you stent, but after you put your stent in to make sure you don't have obstruction uh, in the lateral uh, dimension, but maybe not the AP dimension. So uh, number one intervention, make sure you don't have any obstruction. Uh, number two thing that we do quite commonly, not only after the Fontan, but before the Fontan, is treatment of arteriopulmonary uh, collaterals. Venous collaterals are oftentimes adaptive. You can occlude them and they'll come back, so we don't spend a lot of time with them. Sometimes you need them, but arterial collaterals are always bad. Um, we've used a range of, uh, to, to be like Jamil, we've used a range of weaponry against these collaterals. Um, and uh, our latest uh, fad in our war against aortopulmonary collaterals is actually these microcoils. The coils that we're, sh that we're showing here are uh, coils that are made by Teruma, made by Penumbra rather, that are deployed by microcatheters. And they, they actually enable us to treat these collaterals sort of like particulates. Particulates we don't like as much because they're invisible and if they get to the wrong place they can really cause problems. These microcoils are sort of like particulates that we have much better control over. And we've moved both before and after Fontans to really packing the entire arterial uh, collateral system with these coils. And you can talk to the penumbra rep if you want to hear more about these. Uh, some patients do have extensive veno-venero communications. This patient had actually a massive network of Thebesian collaterals off this lateral tunnel fontan that made this patient fail because of extreme cyanosis. This is Jamil and John Moriarty's idea, and with, uh, with us all in the lab, we placed these big covered stent grafts inside this lateral tunnel fontan, essentially converted it to a extra cardiac fontan and got rid of all the veno-veno collaterals. So 
Um, basic, basic interventions that we do are relief of obstruction, attacking aortopulmonary collaterals. Um, you know, what, what do Fontans have that, what do Fontans not have that we want to have? Well, one of the things is a valve. So as soon as transcatheter valves, as soon as the melody valve became available, you know, it didn't take long for some of our interventional colleagues to just put them in Fontans. Like, hey, maybe, maybe the Fontan would like a valve. So uh, our friend Jonas uh, across, the, uh, across the pond did this in four patients. Um, if you read his paper, uh, two of the valves stopped working, one patient died, but of course he concluded that, that it is technically feasible. <laughs> so <laughs> this is great news. You can do this, but it's a really bad idea. <laughs> so we don't do that anymore, but we appreciate Jonas for trying. Um, <laughs> But it turns out that there are a group of patients that actually have Fontans but still have a ventricle in the Fontan circulation. So patients with modified Bjork Fontans have a little muscle, and muscle does like valves. So patients with Bjork Fontans in this publication that was a collaborative effort by Stanford, Yale, and at two European centers, um, putting mainly Melody valves into the Bjork Fontans, this works. We've done this at UCLA with three or four of Jamil's patients, and I think a patient of Kaiser. We primarily used hybrid technologies to place sapien valves inside uh, Bjork Fontans, and this is really cool because now you've taken a Fontan patient and later on in life moved them to a biventricular circulation. So this works not only in our hands, but in this publication that we were kind of sad to see because we were hoping to be the ones to publish this. Um, so as far as valves are concerned, you know, you can sometimes put a valve in a Fontan, but it's also really important to have two good, Fontan, two good valves on the other side of the Fontan in the systemic ventricle. So we've got to make sure that we're taking care of the systemic valve and the AV valve and whatever ventricle you have. And of course, one of the ways to do that is with the new Mitra Clip technology. This is an example of a case that uh, Jamil, Way, Marcy, and the Mitra Clip team did in a single ventricle patient that did not have a Fontan. And you'll see a great result here. There's three clips, and the AV valve regurgitation is a lot less. And we can now do this in Fontan patients as well. We haven't done it, but we can do it. Um, the access would be, like Jeremy showed, either through the Fontan or directly from the roof of the left atrium to give direct access to the AV valve. Another really cool technology that I think is going to benefit these patients is the cardioband technology. At the break, go Google, I don't have time to show the video, but the video is so cool. Valtech is the original Israeli company. It's now owned by Edwards Cards Cardioband and enables you with a catheter to put an annuloplasty ring anywhere you want. So this is going to really impact not only our Fontan patients and single ventricle patients, but probably all patients. And you could even put a valve inside that thing. So, Next time you go down the YouTube hole, make sure you just type in Cardioband, trust me, thank me later. Um, <laughs> next time you Google searching Liverpool goals on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> this is the same uh, angiogram I showed earlier. Um, of course, one of the things that always comes up with failing Fontans is, hey, let's fenestrate them. And uh, this doesn't always work, it can work, and it's probably worth trying. Uh, older patients, like uh, Dr. Moore just showed, do have a cuff of native tissue that you can go through so you don't have to do this. In a lot of the smaller pediatric patients, you actually, as you see here, have to stick your needle directly through Gore-Tex. We have a lot of tricks to do this, and one of the tricks is just to push real hard. Um, but we can, uh, we can get through, and what we'll do is we'll flare a stent out pull it back against the Fontan, and you see we call it a bow tie stent. It kind of looks like a bow tie there. And, um, well, these videos aren't playing, but you can gradually titrate up the stent until you have the patient decompressed as much as you want them decompressed, hopefully without making them too blue because you're making a right to left shunt. So this is an example of a child that we fenestrated. It's a lot easier in adults because you have that cuff of tissue. This is exactly what Jeremy just showed you, so we won't spend too much time on it, but um, some patients you just can't get through. In this case, there was already a stent in the Fontan, so these authors did what Kevin and, and, and Jeremy do, is poked right through from the, from the pulmonary artery into the left atrium and fenestrated the Fontan that way. So, 
you know, the downside of these fenestrations is you do have uh, uh, material sticking out into your fontan circulation that's not desirable, but there is a lot of ways to come at this, and fenestrating fontans is certainly something to try. This is a device that we need in the United States. Uh, they have it already in Europe. It's made by Oculotech. It's called the Atrial Flow Regulator. It's basically an ASD device that, that creates a defined hole. This will be awesome for Fontan fenestrations as well as make a huge difference in the United States for heart failure. This is a, a custom-made device that's a purpose-built device that is going to allow us to not only decompress left atriums and biventricular patients, but it's eventually, when we get it here, going to help with you know, really making the right fenestration for a Fontan patient. Uh, so uh, we can make fenestrations. Um, and that's a little difficult. What's not so difficult is to close fenestration. So some patients, uh, because of fenestrations, uh, develops, fenestrations are good because they can decompress you, but they're bad because they create cyanosis. And, they de and, and this right to left shunt puts a volume load on the ventricle. The great thing about Fontaine is it takes the volume load off the ventricle. So if you don't need a fenestration, it's better to close it. We will always test occlude the fenestration but it's important to realize that this data we're getting in the cath lab, especially under general anesthesia, does not reflect the, the data in the real world. Um, nonetheless, before we do this with our devices, we'll, we, we make sure by test occluding that, um, that it works. And there's more than one way to come at this. We typically will just plug these things up with our amplats or plugs or, or gore devices. Um, but we can also use covered stents to line the inside of the fontan and um, uh, and come at it in that, in, in that way. Uh, we don't need to get into the effects of fenestration in this talk, but um, it's definitely a double-edged sword. Some patients need them, but if you don't need them, they're better not to have. Um, another way a Fontan can fail is the development of pulmonary AVMs. This Fontan was put in in such a way that all the Fontan flow went to the LPA, none went to the, uh, all the Fontan flow went to the RPA, none went to the LPA, no hepatic factor was going to the right lung, it all went to the left lung. So there was massive pulmonary AVMs in the left lung. And uh, we built this 3D model and devised a, a way in this patient to use covered stents to divert some of the Fontan flow to the left lung without interfering with the Glen flow. Uh, we left some gap in there to allow the font some Fontan flow to still go to the right lung so the same thing didn't happen in the right lung. So you can definitely reroute this. This procedure was first described by Jack Rome in this publication. He's done like 10 stents in these patients. And listen, we can do this. It's probably better not to do it. So it's always good to set up your Fontan surgically so that they go to both lungs. We don't have to put 10 stents in a Fontan because the more material you're putting in there is probably the worst. But we can definitely reroute these Fontans. The other point that I'd like to make is that portal to systemic shunts are also a cause. So it's not just hepatic factor, but you have to have a hepatic factor that comes from the portal vein. The case we did just yesterday was occlusion of a massive portal systemic shunt in a patient with heterotaxy who had huge bilateral pulmonary AVMs. I don't know if that's going to help them, but I think it will. Um, so remember, especially in heterotaxy patients, if you have pulmonary AVMs and you don't know why, it's potentially because of a portal systemic shunt. This is really revolutionary. The ability uh, of us to do Fontans has also messed with the lymphatic system. And patients who have plastic bronchitis have a lymphatic issue, and they have a lymphatic leak, and it can be devastating. It's fortunately not very common, but when you start having these casts form in your lungs, it is, it, it is absolutely devastating for patients, and it's totally treatable. So we're starting to do these sort of interventions at UCLA, but all credit for this to Yo Abdori at CHOP. Uh, we can put microcatheters into the lymphatic system and now embolize the leaks to the lungs and really it's curative for plastic bronchitis. It is not curative for PLE, but it can possibly help for PLE. In PLE, the problem is hepatic lymphatics that drain into the gut. The gut picture there is this methylene blue. And again, Yo all credit to Yoav. We're sending our Sanjay Sinha over to work with Yoav so he can hopefully learn how to do this procedure. But you, you can also get into the hepatic lymphatics and treat PLE some of the time. So lymphatic interventions have just been um, a godsend for these patients. Um, I'm not going to go into um, assist devices. We'll do that later. But of course, Jamil and I and Dr. Lax, we've all thought about using axial flow devices. In our lab, we, I've developed this little pump that you could put on a Fontan with a couple of valves. And, um, 
and a, potentially impart energy into the Fontan. I love the idea of using skeletal muscle in the Fontan, but we can, we do have stuff to offer in the cath lab. Uh, impella devices have been used to help the systemic single ventricle and bridge patients to transplant and recovery. You can also put an impella device directly into a Fontan, and there's this really cool device that's under um, development called the Von Karman top thing that spins right in there and propels your Fontan flow, and it uh, has worked in animals, but we haven't seen any, any further um, development of it. Um, that's really treatment of the failing Fontan. I've just got a minute left, so I'll just say that there are also ways that we can potentially put Fontans into patients if we set ourselves up for that when we do the Glen. You can come in without doing a Fontan surgically and do it in the cath lab. John Cheatham did this by uh, puncturing through the uh, surgically created uh, hemifontan and then putting covered stents in. These videos won't play, but that's fine. Um, uh, the long term, there, there were some issues as the kids grew, but I think that there's going to be the potential in the future to offer not only Fontan takedowns, which we can do, but potentially transcatheter Fontan implantations. Um, uh, moving forward, a lot of our next uh, Next-gen devices are going to uh, be limited by the lack of an animal model, which is something that people have started to develop. So I think things like the MitraClip, the CardioBand, will hopefully continue to change the uh, therapies that we can offer to Fontan patients. Thank you very much.